Do you think the bubble is going to burst, though, with this thing at some point? Well, I was very much not hands-on with cars, blew the engine up. Everything I've learned is off the back of just trying and messing up, as everyone does. So you actually sold your detail in this now? Gone. Gone, yeah. Tell us the story about that. If I don't give it me all now, I'm just going to miss an opportunity. And there's cars I bought which I know I can't fix. The ultimate intention with it is for it to be safe. It's There's a risk factor to it, there's a gamble. There's such a cool storyline from being able to drag something from being worthless to an insurance company to supercharged M3. It makes it exciting, it, no risk, no reward. You, you learn from what doesn't go so well. YouTube is one of the biggest numbers games. What's the next exciting thing on the menu of life? If I throw everything I've got into this, it might not pay back. I think that's like a goal for me. So you've made the decision to do Yes. Wow. <laughs>Chris Slicks, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. My first podcast ever. First podcast ever. First one. And you've been going since about 2019. So it's probably time that we actually got you on one and told your story to your followers and the internet. Yeah, I think it's about time. So we're going to kick it off with the question posed to every guest that comes on. In your own words, who are you and what do you do? So my name's Chris Slicks. I rebuild cars or... Uh, from a crash damage state or a highly neglected state, try and bring them back to what I think is a great example uh, with basically zero knowledge or training. <laughs> and you've become a tremendously well-known and explosive new face on the YouTube automotive scene. And prior to that, even in the detailing world, you're really well-known. You now rebuild the crash damage cars right behind us in the detailing studio. When I think back to your earliest years, say maybe 10 years old or less, what is it that kind of formed you into who that you are now that you can take from back then? Um, so I would say, as in my interest in cars, as all, I think for anyone my age, it's all stemmed from Top Gear. Like anything that was on there was always unachievable. And the fact that now everything's changed and the world's changed and there's different ways where people can get to this situation where they can mess around with cars or do something on you know a similar way. It's like a, it's like a boyhood's dream, isn't it, basically? So I think... That's what's kind of stemmed the love for cars. But I always thought I'd never really get into anything to do with cars. It's a really strange point, but like I've got the worst hands in the world, which is so odd, I know, but it's like really poor skin. So I always thought like being a mechanic, you know, doing detailing, do anything that was like hand orientated would have just absolutely written me off. Um, which I know it seems so odd, but being able to now do this and do it in a way that it's not like strenuous on that and you know, being involved around cars and doing stuff that I'm passionate about. It's just, yeah, I think it's... It's interesting what you say because, again, I grew up with a world watching Top Gear. I absolutely loved it. Favourite show as it was for a lot of people like us that have fallen into the world of cars. And you can kind of look at it and take small, small snipp snippets of things they did in different episodes and people have made entire YouTube channels out of that now. So was that was that a ritual? Was that like part of your growing up? Was Top Gear or was it a Monday night? I think it was it's Sunday, Sunday night. or Monday, weren't it? It was a it Sunday moved night. Around a bit, but yeah, absolutely. I remember watching it with my dad. Like my dad always used to tell me like, I would always dreamed of owning an Aston Martin and while well, they were driving like a Vauxhall Signum or something. And like, yeah, it just became like this thing. And as, it, as Top Gear grew as a thing and became more explosive, it just, yeah, it just became... I was watching like reruns on Dave every weekend and uh, as much of it as I could get, basically. But what do you remember about yourself back then? Were you quite an outgoing kid? Were you quite introverted? Like, who was Chris when he was really young? And what were some of the things outside of Cop Gear that kind of maybe formed where you went? Um, yeah, I'd probably say I was maybe slightly introverted, I guess. Um, I was always like into music. Music was my thing when I was young. So I was like, grew up playing guitar. My dad was always into like rock music and stuff like that. So like, I got to playing guitar at a decent standard and like playing like covers bands and stuff like that, um, which I didn't realise. But like, when I went into do like A levels or similar, I went off doing music and got like a, a two year degree doing that which I thought would never even come in handy. But there's so many similarities in between like making music and making videos. Um, and it just uh, seems to tie together really well now, which I never would have expected would have happened. Do you think you got used to almost performing in front of people as well or to a camera or trying to set a piece by doing that? Camera, definitely not. I've always hated my own voice, which sounds really strange. Like whenever my mum used to like, record me when I was a kid, it was, I always hated it. Like with a passion, I used to hate having my photo taken, um, everything. Like that. Not for any particular reason. I just didn't like it. Um, so maybe not for that reason, but 
I think maybe it got me more used to the fact of just being able to, you know, forget about what's going on and just do something without really thinking too deep into it. Um, yeah, I'd probably say I did help a little bit, but definitely not to camera or anything like that. There was no no recording anything particularly like that. But So what about like family makeup, siblings, mum and dad? What, how, what did kind of life look like when you were younger? Did you witness anybody else doing anything in your life that you thought that was really cool or really interesting? Because where you've ended up now is you're quite kind of in con- full control of your own destiny, bound by no means. What did kind of the life look like around you? So in, in the nice, like, I love mum and dad to bits, don't get me wrong. But the reason why I wanted to do something like this and take a bigger risk is because they were always, they had a insurance broken business and it was the most mundane thing I've ever seen in my life. So they were going into work and like sitting in an office space, phones ringing, emails, just nonstop. And I remember they came to me with the, like, the proposition when I was only young in any way and looking back on it, it was probably the wrong decision, but saying, you know, would you be interested when you get older and taken over that business and I just said not for me I want to do something more exciting but you know I was only like maybe 12 at the time or something so I wasn't really making like an educated decision or anything um but I just wanted something that was a bit more exciting a little bit more active a bit more hands-on and I think that's the it was almost wanting the opposite of that is what made me get into something like this um as you know they were successful and everything I did really well but I just didn't want to be stuck in that office space and stuck in that, you know, almost a corporate world. It wasn't like a corporate sized business or anything, but dealing with those sorts of companies and dealing with that sort of stress didn't really appeal to me. Sometimes when you're around that, when you're younger, it helps form your decision because you just think that either is for me or really that's not for me and sets you off in a different direction. Yeah, definitely. I think also because of the world they were in, they were like every single decision they make is like super calculated in terms of risk and everything because that was literally their job is doing like risk assessments and all that sort of thing. So I think that's what makes the YouTube world a bit more enticing because there's so much risk, so much unknown. It's like, it makes it exciting. It makes it, you know, if, if I throw everything I've got into this, it might not pay back, but it definitely could as well, which I think it kind of throws away that, you know, that thought that thought train of everything being so planned out. And when you look back in hindsight, is there like a single moment that you can connect uh, maybe in your teenage years to stuff that you're doing now like that was the moment that had like a really profound effect that made me go in a specific direction because a lot of this is actually not how you got to maybe YouTube and your channel where you are now but it's how you got to have been an ind- independent detailing company which tens of thousands of people my friends included would love to be in that position so um it's strange I wouldn't say so no not really it was it, that really came on late and uh, the thing that I remember is like started getting me interested in cars and things like that though is like working on i used to like, ride my bike everywhere like, absolutely everywhere so I have, like, a career a mountain bike and i must have rode that thing into the floor it was so i remember just having to maintain it and stuff like that and i found like a, a passion for that in a way but i never kind of like did it as a hobby or as a, a side job there's nothing that like triggered it from that side of things um i mean the, th- the thing that did that i think happened later on in life um i say later on i was still young but it was yeah, it was definitely further down the line that happened. So paint as a picture, were you quite educated? Were you quite kind of run of the mill at school? What was skill, school like for you? And then leaving that into going into kind of like a first job, what did that look like? From what I remember, as at an early age, so like primary school years, I was always, I was like pretty switched on, pretty interested. But as I like progressed further and further, I became less and less interested. Um, and I think it was because of, I started to see like the holes in the education uh, and you know what and what they're trying to teach and I was like well I don't these aren't the things which I need to learn therefore I started losing interest and like, like I haven't used Py- what's it called Pythagoras's theorem <laughs> once since I've left school so why did I need to know it what I needed to know about was like tax returns and all this sort of stuff they don't ever teach you and I think I just my mom like my mind started to wonder the further on in my school life I went and I just got to the point where I just really didn't gel with it at all so I started off quite well and then the older I get the you know the, the more I think my mind started thinking and I just didn't really you know, gel with the whole school system that well, really. So so were you wa- washing cars on people's drives growing up for a bit of money? What was the first job that you kind of had? The only one I remember doing was my dad's. That was it. I think that everyone's done that, haven't they, for a bit of pocket money or something. But yeah, that was the first one I remember doing. But it wasn't until, yeah, until I was like gone 21 where I started like thinking, oh, I could actually do something with that. It was only found detailing as something that I was interested in after I'd even got into cars. So it wasn't like a thing that I grew up doing or practicing. It was always, you know, it was just the fact I got into cars and then I thought, oh, I'm actually all right at this. It's like, and 
So was that working on your own card? Did you pass your test at 17, get out there in something, and yeah, then just start 17. to take an interest in that because you had an interest in automotive? I just always knew I love cars. It's always been Lamborghinis for me. I'm sure, you know, you're an ad, a Lamborghini advocate, so... Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, the, the passion for me was always around supercars and stuff like that. So when I first started passing my test, I was never that interested in the sort of cars that you're limited to at that age. Um, but as I got a little bit older, as I hit like 2021, 20, I started to like... You know, oh Christ! Yeah, yeah, that's a little bit older. Yeah, so then I, you know, found that you know it's not all Vauxhall courses and Fiestas for the rest of my life. Um, then I started to really get into it all, and then you know, pick up a couple of different cars that I kind of found a bit more passion in. So, where, how did that develop into something that you were doing full time, like as a detailing business? So, well, to give you the full story, from when I left after doing my music degree or BTEC or whatever, it's not quite a degree, I guess. Um, I then left college there at 18 not having a clue what i was going to do i was just what the hell am i going to do in my life and then my brother went for a job interview at a window sales company and it turned out he didn't want the job but i was like I'll give anything a go so I went in there as a sales rep and did really really well at like the age of i think it was my 19th birthday i did like three and a half thousand pound in commission which is 19 it's just nuts and it? it's like money you didn't even think was real um, but I, I just fell out of love with that job so heavily because, well, I'm sure you, everyone's heard about the Windows sales tactics. It's not even necessarily down to the salesman doing it. There's so much pressure from like, upper management to you know to perform these things that ain't 100. percent They're not um, 100 percent legit. Is probably the way I put it. And I just didn't love that. It didn't feel moral. Um, so moved out of that after about a year and a half and went into a, a sofa sales company. Uh, called Sofa Works at the time. They've moved forward now into a different company name, but that was a much better place to work for because they're, they're again, Sofa Sales, very similar to Windows. There's always a lot of this DFS sale never ends, does it? No. Um, but yeah, literally, they, they, literally, yeah, it's always <laughs> on. So this company, they were like, look, we realize that is how the market looks and we're going to do the complete opposite. These are our prices. We don't do sales. You know, there's no pressure selling admittedly there was still pressure from upper management but that's sales but it was a much nicer slower paced company to work for it was about finding the right thing for the right person and yeah that's kind of where i did there again management falls through and through you kind of feel like you're having a carrot dangled in front of you to try and progress within the company which i probably wanted a bit quicker than what i should have wanted but then found myself moving back to this uh, the window company as a sales manager and just did six weeks i was like i can't do this anymore and then went what can i do and I thought, well, I like washing my car, so I'm going to go wash cars. And it was as simple as that. Yeah. Just it's because this is mundane to me, forget the money. I've made more money than I thought I could at this age and learning about sales and all the rest of it. You just thought, right, no, I'm done. I'm going to do this. It was more a thing of like, can I be miserable doing what I'm doing and dreading going to work every day for the rest of my life? I just couldn't do it. And as I said, my only passion was cars, really. It was that and... Yeah, I used to go to the gym quite a lot. Not so much anymore. <laughs> um, so I was just like, well, if I'm into cars and that's what I enjoy doing and being around, let's go and do something with cars. So that's how I, got, I fell into that, really. And then I went from doing, you know, a, de- a decent wage, especially for like, you know, 2021. Um, you know, the three and a half grand a day was never consistent. That was a one-off. But um, that to go into like earning £30 a week, but just to do something that I was passionate about. And it eventually, after, it was a lot of work to get like the website up and running, to get all this sort of, like, get your name out there, get practiced in what you're doing. Because realistically, I didn't have any experience in it. I just decided I was going to do it. Yeah, to then do that, and then I've got to obviously learn my trade whilst I'm doing it. So you made the decision to do a trade without learning how to do the trade? Yes. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so how the hell did that go? Did you go on any courses? I know that detailing actually almost gets a little bit better as you go up up north there's a lot more places i'll probably get slaughtered in the comments for that but it seems that every detailing person that we've had on the podcast or whatever that's come from that world we always seem to be going north but how did you kind of learn to do that it was just there's so much stuff online with everything there's also a lot of i think the biggest thing i learned in that trade was to see through the uh the marketing of all these products so as soon as i learned that as soon as i learned that you don't need you know, a specific thing for this, 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 for everything. A lot of the things in there do this a very similar thing. So once you've learned exactly how they work, then you can just tailor that to that car. Um, So it was just being self-taught, but I don't think there is really any training that you can take in doing that trade that's as good as just practicing because you need to learn how 
all these different products and chemicals and all these things react with things in a different way. And you also need to make mistakes, which I definitely did. Um, but, you know, you learn from your mistakes and maybe sometimes not as fast as you should. But, you know, that's the same as within any business, isn't it? You, uh, you, you learn from what doesn't go so well. And you mentioned your website there because that's where I took a look on to look at some of the stuff that you had detailed. And mm-hmm. I saw Rosso Beer, Aventador SVs, Aston Martin Vanquishes, like some of the cars that you worked on, Porsches, Takers, the list just goes on and on. I know up to recently you were doing, you were still detailing cars. Yeah. Now it's very different. There's a, an X3M in bits. It's almost inside the polar your, opposite, It's complete it? polar opposite inside your detailing studio. So I love the whole point of Road to Success is to find out how someone just took that initial moment. You can see with you, there's that initial moment where you've almost gone, fuck it, I'm not doing this anymore, I'm doing something else. Mm. And then hear how people's journeys kind of progress from that. But here, there's almost two things going on. Because you had an initial, fuck it, I'm not doing that anymore to get yeah. to detailing. And now you're on YouTube, 100k subscribers, a gorgeous silver plaque on the shelf inside and averaging well over 100,000 views a video at the minute like how the hell does that happen honestly i have no idea <laughs> sometimes i just think like some things in life are meant to be and if you try hard at whatever you're doing it's always going to work out you know you may have some rocks in the road along the way but it's how you deal with those and how you steer around them and how you get over that as to what happens next and that's exactly how it's been with the detail and that's exactly how it's been with the youtube stuff as well YouTube is definitely, in some respects, some people will sit here and say then they don't focus on any of the numbers whatsoever and they just do it for the love of it and X, Y, Z. Personally, I think YouTube is one of the biggest numbers games there is out there. And at the minute, anybody, any car fan looking in can clearly see that rebuilding crash damage supercars online or performance vehicles and putting them back together and co-parts probably had the best advertising out of any company ever in the last year um for free online but in terms of we've had freddie on here tavarish we've had matt armstrong on here like you can clearly see that if you were gonna pick something to do on youtube as long as you liked rebuilding stuff that's not a bad avenue to no, pick at the they have really paved the way for so many other people like it's not just myself like there's so many other channels which have you know seen how how successful that's been and you know even if you're only you're only taking a small slice of that same pie you're still going to be doing okay but as you mentioned then there is literally hundreds of channels now trying it out but yours stands out so do you want to tell us the story of how you got into building your first crash damage car how that looked and then how the channel has kind of exploded from there yeah well there is kind of like a bit of a an area before that where i was doing videos with the detailing business so i did about a year's worth of videos on what i was doing that week with whatever car i had in you know what that process looked like how i know and then obviously in a similar way to like the rebuilding stuff is like how people can transfer to that to their cars at home and i've unlisted those videos now because i don't want those to get suggested oh. it's not out of like a shame or anything like that but i don't want people to watch one of my current videos and then get suggested that and then not watch it because they'd rather get suggested something relevant that's the only reason um but yeah it, that kind of paved the way there for me and then after my plan was always after a year of doing that, I'm going to make a, a swap into doing something more exciting with cars. When it kind of I got a, a small following, it was only like one or two thousand subscribers or something, uh, which is exactly what I did. So I went and bought the highest mileage 350Z in the UK, or what near enough was. You know, was what was that? It was about two hundred thousand miles. Yeah, crikey. Um, full of rust. Uh, the worst engine code you could get. Um, and it was like two thousand or three thousand pound or something like that. Um, and then, you know, got to working on that. My intention was never to do crash cars. That was never what I... You just thought. fancied it again? Not quite. It was because what I did with that 350Z, I ended up putting like the maddest body kit you could find on it, painting it in the most stupid colour. Um, you know, it was making the most out there car you could possibly build, essentially saying... I'm and here. was this for you or was this for YouTube because you'd seen that content start to do well? When was this? Was I this 2020? I just, I just wanted to try something new. So yeah, it would have been, I think it's getting on for three years ago now, maybe okay. something like that. Maybe two, yeah, about three, two or three years ago, anyway. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to do something that was, you know, just just push myself really to do something different because I'd done everything that I felt I could do within detail. And I was like, well, you know, what's next? What's the next exciting thing on the on the menu of life? Joyce, you know, it's, it's it's strange. I've got to say that because a lot of the guests you come on, you tend to find people ask me, do you see similarities? in people that have done well and people that have got something cool going on that comes on the podcast. And that right there is is one of the things that I pick up on, which is people going, well, I just I felt felt like I completed it. It's yeah. like levelling up and again, they're always like 
feel like they get to the end of a chapter and need to start the next one is something that I see across everybody really. 100%. And well, detailing as a, as a business, it, I found it so hard to upscale. Um, so like the, the profit margins and everything as a sole trader, you know, I work out, I was working out of my garage at home, which you know kept overhead super low, which made profits higher and also helped me keep my prices cheaper rather than paying, you know, thousands of pounds a month for a unit. And then, but if I was to upscale it, that means getting a bigger place, taking stuff on, stuff like that. And the, the, the money doesn't really grow with the size of the company. So it kind of worked best as a one man business for me. Um, so what was my, my train of thought here? I can't remember. Your train of thought was how how you got to, you building that 350Z, the yes. yellow one, full of rust, figuring out what you were going to do with it. You're putting a body kit on it. And that was about three years ago. So yeah. how that turned into a kind of YouTube product yeah. and what that looked like. Definitely. So yeah, it was just my, my goal with that was just do the most out there thing I can say, you know, look at me, I'm here. <laughs> It sort of worked to a degree. I think I got to about 10,000 uh, subscribers off the back of that in the end after about 20 videos. You know, some of them were just putting wheels on, putting suspension on, like single thing videos. But that's how you've got to operate it as a small channel because you can't afford to put thousands and thousands into each video. You need to spread it out as best you can. And yeah, it did it sort of, it, it did what it was meant to do. But the crash damage thing for me was never, that was never on the radar. I just wanted to build cool stuff. But then... So that then, car wasn't crash damaged. It was just crushed. a bit of a dog. It was just a dog, yeah. I bought it from like a like an open prison essentially it was a bit of a sketchy do uh, but matt came with me to buy that and um yeah in the, in the end then the next car i did was a one series which was again i wide bodied it put a one m body kit on it did all this stuff and then when i remember having this conversation and it was like why am i doing this to nice cars or nice ish cars with that are fully complete when if i go and buy a crash one it works out considerably cheaper and then means that i can still do all this stuff to him because i'm going to be replacing those parts anyway so if it's got a damaged rear quarter, I'm going to be cutting out to put a wide body on. Or if the front bumper's damaged because you know I'm going to be replacing it for something more out there anyway, why am I doing it with a car that's got good bits that I've then got to go and try and sell on and all that sort of stuff? So that's kind of how I fell into the crash stuff, really. And how how does one just end up with Matt Armstrong going to... I mean, I think the same thing when we were doing our video the other day, <laughs> flying around a track. But how does one end up with Matt Armstrong just going and doing that with the car? Were you guys friends beforehand? Yeah, so mine and Matt's relationships, like, it's like the... It's just a complete fluke and accident, really. So Liam, who is one of Matt's mates as well, uh, he bought the purple Audi S3 for me and Liam went to school together. Um, he always used to, like, at the same time, me and Liam were best mates, him and Matt were best mates, but we never crossed paths um, because they were into BMXing. I was into music music and messing around, um, basically. So we never really had that crossover then, but we knew of each other, but we just never met. And the time that, well, I basically met Matt through his Golf R. Uh, it was actually that far, far down the line. And... Uh, but he had it was you know, a crashed one, full of mold, all this, that, and the other. And there's one of the videos I was doing back then with the detailing business went round there, film cleaning that up. And then that's kind of. So if you look back through the Matt Armstrong archives, you can see you're yeah, probably yeah. detailing a uh, golf R somewhere. Yeah, I think the video is still live on my channel, to be fair. But and that got you thinking, well, the next project I do then needs to be something crashed. No, that was that was in that was before I even started building cars. Right. So that was just in the detail. <laughs> where you met videos. Matt? Yeah, okay. that was just where I met Matt. So. Yeah, but then once I'd realised that like, I'm buying all these panels to replace panels that are already good, what's the point? You know, if I want to do something mad to a car, why not do it with a crash damage one? Because it works out financially better and it pushes you that bit further. Um, so I think the first crash one I got was an Aston Martin Vantage, which is probably a little bit in at the deep end, really, when it comes to crash stuff. But it's just what you got to do, isn't it? So, you know, got that one, put a full uh, genuine V12 Vantage kit on it. So it like... It basically owed me, I think, 28 grand, but looked like a you know, 80, 90 grand car. It would be nice if you could have sold it for 80, 90 grand. Yeah, I sold it for 28 grand or 27 grand. I think I made a little bit, a little bit of a loss, but that tends to be the uh, the ongoing structure. And was that for fun or was there any plan behind this? Of, Do you know what? I think I can build up a channel as well. It was never really like, there was never really an intention behind it, if that makes sense. So I never had the full intention of going full time with YouTube. That was never my... Um, you know, my end game or anything. Is that the right word, phrase? Yeah, no, um, like that you didn't really, there was no plan where you just kind of rolling with it and doing what you wanted to just, do at Yeah, the it's time. having a bit of fun, pushing myself to do something different and, you know, seeing where it takes me because I, think, I feel like if you have, if you set yourself too much of a plan, you can end up sticking to that and it might not be what was meant to happen. So just rolling with it, having a bit of fun with it and, you know, seeing what comes out at the end. But I try and pick out because there's thousands of people 
having a little bit of a go at something or trying something across the UK. And we tend to sit down with the people that have rode to success, made it happen and trying to figure out why that happened and what were those kind of key decisions or way of critical thinking that kind of produced that result. And no doubt there is a little bit of luck in some people's yeah. bits, but you were consistently uploading videos, right? And you've done quite a lot of projects now. Do you want to reel us off? Like when you kind of, you mentioned about the Aston Martin, but what's some of the, the cars that you built over the last few years and how many videos do you reckon it's taken to get to kind of 100,000 subscribers? Yeah, sure. So we had firstly the Nissan 350Z, which turned out as a wide body, rocket bunny, stupid car. Then a E82 BMW 135i. Blue. Purple. Was it purple? <laughs> it was purple. Did you race it at Santa Pod? Mm, no, no, I did race. It, it was the one I saw on the stairs. Yeah, that's oh, why okay, I couldn't yeah. quite pick the no, color. That's a, that's a car from before. That was before when I was DT, and that was before YouTube. Um, then it was a Aston Martin Vantage with a V12 kit, an Audi TTS with an RS kit wrapped in satin blue, a Hyundai i30N which got wide bodied, one of two in the UK. Um, then a Jaguar F Type SVR. A what was after that? Mark 8 Golf R, followed by the BMW X3M and the M3, which we've... Which you're both still working on. Yeah, they're work in progress still. Well, I think you've missed out a pretty critical one in there as well. What have I missed? A, a certain R8 that's on oh, the drive yes. out yeah, the yeah. front. A powder blue R8. <laughs> yeah, and that's right. That is a pretty... To be fair, I'm very surprised you forgot that one, because that's got to be a fundamental car for your channel, right? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's... I think I was surprised by that car by I wasn't expecting it to do as well as it did. The R8, because it's been done before by so many people, Matt's done one. Yeah, I said in my first video on it, everyone has modified these cars now where if you go to a show, you can almost guarantee to be seeing an R8 that's been wrapped, put on air ride with some wheels on it. Like that's how well, like, how much they've been done. But I wanted to go on a, a different road with that. Um, because obviously Mark had had that car. Apparently when he got it, it was quite a nice, clean example. Mark McCann, that is. And, you know, rallied it around his field. It always had the intention of like jumping it. You know, he wanted to jump a supercar and obviously put it on like they put the coilovers, but raised them all the way up and then stripped all the panels off it to try and protect them and then just left it because he got his Strato. You know, we've all seen that video of it jumping. Um, you know, and then it just got neglected, left in the garden, like collecting moisture inside, dead battery, you know, missing all the panels, everything. And just seeing it, I was like, that car needs saving. Like, that's, that's a dream car for someone just sat there in bits. Um, so I, I had to have it off. It was like fate, especially like my and Mark's relationship is good anyway. So on the way back from when we were filming his McDonald's video where we ate every McDonald's in in the country in 24 hours, which was the worst decision of my life, I managed to convince him to to sell it to me and uh, get it back in one piece, like back to complete factory spec almost, um, which I think a, a lot of people are really receptive to that, which I didn't think there would be. Everyone's kind of grown, you know, seeing me modify cars and seeing a car go back to original from being such a neglected state. Okay, it was a shorter build series, but it went down really well. I was quite happy with that one. And I guess you can take them a step further than a lot of the guys as well, because once you've actually built it all together, you can then detail it and take it almost back to how it was supposed to leave the showroom. Yeah, and if not much, better. Pretty much, yeah. So, I mean, that one was, it was really bad. Like, I've still got a bucket of the mud out of Mark's field if anyone wants to buy it. <laughs> um, yeah, it was, the amount of mud in that car was like something you've never seen before. Like, we, you know, had it up on... Um, up on ramps outside, like jet washing it for days, ice blasting it, like doing all this stuff. And this, you still find a little bit now, like it's still not a hundred percent. Um, you know, it, dri it drives perfectly now, but it's, you know, you still find the odd bit here. And I, was, every time I clean it, I find myself like finding more coming out of gaps and things like that. So it's going to be a, it definitely will get there one day, but it's just going to take a lot of cleaning. So someone that come from, I'd say, a sales background then in their first kind of job roles yeah. to then going into detailing, which is kind of semi-learning with all the tools and kind of taking bits off cars and trying to get in all the nooks and crannies and make them a lot better. Are you then also then to do the rebuilding the cars, just completely learning how to do all of this off of YouTube and on the spot? Yeah, pretty much. So it's, it's all just... Like the 350Z started off super basic and I was I was very much not hands-on with cars. I'd pay someone to change my brakes. That was only three years ago. Like I was before I started that project. And half of the reason why I picked that car is one, because it was cheap. And I didn't mind messing up on it, which I definitely did. I blew the engine up. Um, you know, it wasn't the end of the world to re replace something on it if I did break it. And it was a great like learning step for me. And that's really what got me into you know, where I am now with it all and everything I've learned is off the back of just trying and messing up. 
as everyone does, like I said earlier, and so, making those mistakes. People see where you've got to now and your channel, as we mentioned earlier, is absolutely flying at the minute. I think you put out a video last night. I don't know if it's quite 100k yet, but it's pretty much there. Yeah. By the time we were there, and to get 100,000 views consistently on videos in 24 hours, it's taken a hell of a lot to get there. But like, we everybody kind of sees things in the moment but the bit that i like to try and get across to people is what's actually got into that and we've just reeled off a whole list of cars there which are videos and projects and hours worth of of editing how many videos have kind of gone into doing that and what was was there any points in which you were doing that that you thought oh, fucking hell, what am i doing with this um yeah i mean it's one video a week it doesn't sound like the hardest thing in the world you know to organize getting the parts um, then doing the work itself at first, not it's pretty manageable. Like I could run that on the side of my business, but as the channel progressed and as YouTube itself kind of progresses, people expect more, they expect a higher standard. And I think to compete in, you know, like with Matt, to compete with Freddie, you know, I'm not on their level, but the fact is if I want to get anywhere near that, I've got to be pushing myself to do it as much as I can, produce it as well as I can in order to, you know, fit you know, if, if someone's watching those videos to still find mine entertaining as well. Um, so as the further it's progressed through YouTube, it's become harder and harder. That's why I ended up having to sell the business to make more time to be able to, you know, or, like I say, organize more parts, plan out my next videos. If I'm working with another company, then, you know, organize that, then actually do the work itself, which in some weeks is like 30, 40 hours worth of work. Uh, which doesn't look like it on camera, but it takes a while then to get the video edited. Like you find yourself working like 80, 90 hours a week. So you actually sold your detailing business? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Gone. Gone. Yeah. hundred percent gone. Tell us a story about that. There's only so much like I want to go into with it just because it's, you know, it, it was someone that I was working with essentially who bought it. I was subcontracting some of the mobile work to him because I'd, it fell out of love slightly with going out in, you know, cold winter weather cleaning car after car after car, unpacking the van, cleaning it, packing up straight onto the next one. Like it is relentless. Um, but then as I found myself kind of thinking, you know what, this YouTube thing could work. Um, I thought if I don't give it me all now, I'm just going to miss an opportunity. So I just had to, I said to the guy who was doing it, I said, look, I'm going to pack this in. I think, do you want to buy the business? And he agreed a figure and shook hands and got it done. And how many kind of subs and um, what sort of space were you on in the channel when you made that decision? This was pretty recently, to be fair. This was kind of September time, I think. Oh, wow. So I was just getting the Golf R, I think, and something around that. So you sit very relaxed and very calm. And as you said earlier, the most easygoing, chilled, relaxed guy. And I definitely think if you're listening to this, you can pick up on that. There must be a part of you that sits back and to make all those decisions, there'll be a degree of self-belief. There must be a part of you that looks at your friend Matt's channel and looks at Freddie's and can see that you're consistently getting views and someone that loves cars. And as you said, you see things on top gear and you think, could I, could I be doing that one day? Is that going to be real? Do you look with a degree of you expect to get somewhere because some of the other boys have like, Not or is, are you all living in the moment? I, I think it's just, I just enjoy what I do. I'm so passionate about kind of everything to do with it. There's not one part of it I'm not enjoying, which I've learned along the way, which, I, like I said, I didn't expect that to happen. But I've just found myself, when I was detailing anyway, and doing this at the same time, I spent all of my time detailing with my headphones in, just thinking about what I was doing next. Like, how am I going to afford this set of wheels? How am I going to do this? How am I going to do that? How am I going to get this car finished? And that was all that was going around in my head. And I was just, it's got to be, I just have to do it. If you can't get it off your mind, it's got to be done. And what does it feel for that um, lad that was just trying to find his feet and has kind of fallen in to doing all of this and then built up this channel? I was recently with you at Autosport, which is when I met you. Um, and then one night you were very drunk and it was very funny <laughs> to watch and see the real Chris. But like when people are coming up to you and wanting to take photos and, you know, we're, we're very critical. And I think it's because of the amount, as you said, YouTube has definitely changed again recently because the, the level of which you have to be at to get views and make it into a viable business and all the rest of it, I think is a lot higher than what, what people kind of think where the bar is maybe necessarily. Yeah, I think so. I think, oh. Was it baffling to meet some of the people and start coming up and having photographs and like all that stuff that comes with growing a channel? What's that been like it's to kind of I mean, feel? Obviously my channel, I've been mates with Matt for longer than my channel's really been about on the radar. So I've seen kind of when he was at 100 and some thousand subscribers, when we were to go to Cafe and Machine, there was people taking photos of him. So it's like at this channel, where the channel is now, I sort of 
it, in a strange way because I've seen it all before. I've kind of I'm, I'm used to it a little bit more. I Aligned guess. with it, but yeah. it still seems weird that people want a photo and they, <laughs> like, I still can't wrap my head around like why like it's, it, it doesn't quite add up and do you just naturally seem to be a natural born problem solver that just likes to figure stuff out or has there been anything that's ever trumped you so far you're like oh, i just can't fucking get past this bit on this car um i mean there's cars i bought which i know i can't fix which i think there's no shame in doing that because like the xtm for example like that was the, the main one i bought that knowing that it's got two bench chassis legs like i already went out viewed the car i know that those need replacing which is a huge job so i took like the engine out the interior out completely stripped it back in myself in my garage um and then shipped it off to a body shop to have the chassis leg done because i know i'm not going to be like, keeping that car forever it's the, the the ultimate intention with it is to be safe like it's going to be a really fast car like i don't want someone to end up injuring themselves or you know or worse because of something that i've tried to do out of ego uh, in trying to do it myself. So, yeah, sent that off to a body shop, had the chassis leg replaced, uh, had the other one repaired, and, you know, was involved in that process. So I was able to learn from them doing that. So hopefully I can tackle something similar to that in the future after I've seen it being done. But, you know, I think ultimately the safety of the car comes first because it's going to be going for a long time after the videos are done. And how is that kind of market being changed by what's going on from you, Matt, and what's going on? on kind of the YouTube space the the but because before if anybody would see a, a cat s or a cat whatever car on auto trader or piston and say but whoa steer clear as a motorhome car or something like that do you think people are now more open to the prospect of actually purchasing these cars I've never heard any like you and Matt actually talk about selling them or getting out of them I've seen stuff raffled off obviously yeah, yeah. but like do you think the markets are changing and people's views on rebuilding stuff's changing i think it's like a fear of the unknown thing because like if you just see a car that's advertised as a cat s um i remember seeing a video on calvin's car diaries channel yesterday and it's like uh, he was doing a video with dean from saving salvage and he's like these two cars are category s one of them was mashed like beyond belief like bent chassis legs it was all over the place and the other one had a minor knock so because there is no indication of you know what condition the car was in um, apart from the fact it's now repaired. You don't know how bad it was. You don't know what how it's been done. There's so much unknown stuff. So I think that maybe does scare people away a little bit. But the great thing with doing it and filming the whole process is if someone's curious on that particular car, they can go and watch exactly what you've done like down to the T and know everything about that rebuild and how it's been done. And if they don't like it, they don't have to buy it. But if they do like it and they're, you know, they're buying it for the car that it is rather than the fact it's been crashed. I think they don't mind it. What do you think is the current... Why is there such a fascination, do you think, about rebuilding the cars on YouTube? Why do you think people are so captivated by it? I just think it's like... It's just such a cool story and that there's so much to it and it's it's like it's educational. It's There's a risk factor to it. There's a gamble. There's just so, such a cool storyline from being able to drag something from being you know basically worthless to an insurance company to being what might be, you know, in my case, a supercharged M3 or in you know, other people's cases, like, you know, uh, Freddy's having a P1 that's been dragged through. A f it's just such a cool way of saving a car. And it makes it, I think, even though sometimes to fix these cars, it costs more than it does just to go and buy a nice one in the first place. It makes it feel like a sense of achievement for the person who's done it, for the people that are watching. Like, there's a, a thing like you're all involved, I think along the way and they've been able to help out in some cases which has definitely happened with me like comment sections have been able to help do you think the bubble is going to burst though with this thing at some point do you think it, there's such a wave of people that are kind of new to this i know everybody from personal trainers that kind of have no interest of cars but they're so interested in watching a car being put back together whether it be on your channel or matt's channel and there's there's this wave what feels like a bowling ball a snowball rolling down a hill gaining so much traction where do you think this whole kind of on online YouTube market can go? Do you think there's more views to be had out of it? Or do you think the bubble is going to burst at some point? I think with the right video in the right way, it can be uh, astronomical, uh, huge. Like, I, I, feel, I feel like we've only seen half of its potential so far. But it's inevitable that we'll be get, get to a point on YouTube where everyone's seen everything. And there is a case of gonna, you know, what's going to be next. But as the channels grow which are doing it, you know, the potential for what they can do grows. So it doesn't even, you know, there's no say in what, you know, what could happen next. People must say the R8, the high Hyundai, the way the drive looks out the front, the extra, yeah, all the parts come in, the cool studio that you're doing the work in, all the rest of it, and think that you must be balling off the back of it currently sat there in your Moschino jumper. 
Is that the case? Or yeah. how hard has it been to go from selling your detailing company to try and make YouTube work full time? Like I remember at Autosport, I said to you when we were talking on the stage that I'd not took a wage out of uh, YouTube at all at that point. I mean, this is only a few weeks ago, but I have since took a single wage out of it to be able to pay like, you know, my, my bread and butter stuff. But that's the first time I've done it. Since. And literally that is all he had in the fridge was pretty much <laughs> bread and butter. <laughs> Not even bread. <laughs> so how, is it really tight to make all that kind of work with the carb? Because there's so many parts coming in to and build these things. It does make it difficult. Like it's The outlay per video for me is like four or five thousand pounds, which is wow. nuts really. And it's like, I wonder sometimes, you know, if I have a bad run, like what's going to happen? But... I feel like I owe it to everyone who's subscribed already. Like all everyone who's like I've built a level of trust up with that I don't want to disappoint. Um, and if I don't do you know as much as I can to make that video the best it can be in you know at, in my capabilities that like, I've not done them justice. So th there is like a, a risk to it, and it's it's getting hard to manage in terms of actually just storing stuff. Like you've seen out here, it's it's like a scrapyard in my garden. Like it's overtook my house. Um, I've got a bonnet laid in front of my TV. Um, my spare bedroom's got like wings in it. Like my other garage is full of broken parts that I might need or might not need. Chris is single, by the way. <laughs> you can see why, which is why he gets away with having this yeah. everywhere. But like, it's I, I need a bigger space now. Like, I need it. It's not even like a want. Like, to put an engine in a car in a double garage is tight, especially when it's like a, an X three M. So, like a big engine, big car. It's a tight space to do it in. Like, I think there is a certain level, like a, a relatability side of it. Maybe the fact that the, spe the space is small. Like the only reason that looks so nice is because I was detailing in there, so I had it all kitted out for that. I wouldn't have done it otherwise. To be honest with you, it'd be looking like a normal little garage um, that you that most people would have set, their house. Do you set yourself targets with it though? Do you have any targets in your head for where you want the channel to be by a certain point? Like, I try, I try and get through to there. there must be something in there that's that gets you wanting to get to the next level on the next level. I, I always try and set myself like unrealistic targets. So like last year it was to hit hundred thousand subscribers, which at the start of the year I think was at like ten thousand. So to ten x the subscriber count in a year, I thought probably not going to happen, but I've got to try it. And you know, it it was a, like a slow ball rolling at the start of the year, which you know slowly picked up a bit of traction and you know, started moving forwards, and it just like just scraped it in the end. Ended up like hitting it on like you know, mid mid December or something, which I didn't think was even possible. So I always want to make sure my targets are hard, but not unachievable as well at the same time. So like I don't know. It's the subscriber thing doesn't really matter to me that much because I just want to know that the people are you know, watching something they're enjoying, they're on board with what's going on. And it is, as long as it's growth in the right direction, I'm happy. And your views are literally pretty much matching your subspace. So how do you keep those guys engaged? Where do you go from where you are now? Obviously, you've got to finish off a mammoth of a project from an X3M, but how many kind of videos and plans ahead are you always having to think to make a channel like this work? Um. I've got an idea of what I want to do next week, but nothing done to do it. <laughs> so yeah. you're li you're literally living one one video. Yeah. Next. So like, I cannot believe the cost of those videos. By the way, it's nuts. It is absolutely nuts. Like last week, we went down to um to Kings Lynn with my BMW M3, which we put a supercharger on uh, in the video before, and then you know did the rod bearings, did all like the essential maintenance stuff, um, and then got it tuned. And that video was finished being filmed on Friday night. Got back at about midnight. And then editing all weekend to get it out last night. That's insane. So it's, it's like that fast pace. Then I've already kind of now, I think I placed the order with some parts with BMW yesterday. Been and picked some up today before we've done this. And then that'll be this week's video is getting the engine back in the X3. So I'm hoping I've got everything. I'm hoping it works out. I'm hoping I've got enough parts to make it work. But you've always got to have an idea of what you're doing. But the funds aren't fluid enough to be able to go, right, I'm just going to buy everything I need and then do it when the schedule works it it's like any other like business that. it's cash flow right 100 mm, percent. see it's absolutely incredible how you've kind of grown that quick but you've not because it's still a year and as you say it's gained traction but to be kind of those views matching the video and every car that you're kind of bringing on you need to kind of get it to achieve those views otherwise you can't continue in a way that's insane and it's the problem is i end up building cars which are like my a dream thing to own like i've always i'm a big bmw fan like i can't help it um, that's why M3 and X3 are like two really cool cars to me and it's kind of like a bittersweet thing because I get to build it I get to build like my dream version of it like I can't keep it because it's I need the money back out of the car to then go and buy another one 
it's like it's kind of like it's so nice it's to be able to do 22. it is yeah it is so it'd be like so i think that's like a goal for me is to be able to like keep a car because i love it um and there has been a few which i would have like the the um the one series which i did the purple one i love that car to bits i feel like i'm gonna have the same relationship with both of these bmws as well surely um, that could be the day a lamborghini touches the channel potentially yeah. I, I say i'm lamborghini through and through like it's is that the is that the ultimate goal at the minute it, then? literally yeah i mean it's i can't think of anything i want more i'm not bothered about a big house i don't want like a you know a glamorous way to live i just want a lambo so bad i just can't get it out of me i ended up driving matt's mercy for you know a couple of hours like a few months back in the summer and it was just like it's just everything i could have wanted as a kid even i don't care like with an italian car i feel like you put aside all of the things that you expect from a car and you just accept it for what it is and just enjoy it like especially with the older stuff you know, like yours it's not uh they're, they're built really well all this sort of stuff but the older stuff it's like they're, they're shoddily put together in by some people who wave their hands about a lot and hope for the best but it's just like such a the pre-audi generation yeah the Lamborghini. pre-audi generation lamborghini is just uh it's just so much rawness to it and I, I, you always end up loving the flaws with it as well because it's I don't know if that makes sense. Ben, you're you're editing everything yourself. Mm-hmm. So if you get that Lambo project, you get it done, you would buy all those parts, you're fitting all the parts, you're filming it all yourself, you're editing it all yourself. What kind of change was there in terms of the channel progressing when you decided to take the leap and go sell that detailing company and go full time with it? Was there a noticeable change in terms of uplift? Yeah, I'd say so. I think, well, it, it kind of all happened at once. We just finished a probably the worst road trip of my life which we'll go into in a bit um going across europe um which a second video on the second video on that for me did really well with nico um the watch guy we blew up his 812 didn't they or he well he blew up the exhaust his 812 that, could, that video convinced me not to put an exhaust <laughs> on my 812 if there ever was one well it turns out after all that it was just a battery fault um but ferrari like voided his warranty and all sorts of stuff he had a real real bad time with it um and then following on from that, I put a video out saying like I'm selling my business and all my cars, um, which I end up keeping the i30 in the end. My goal was to sell two out of the three cars, which I managed to do. I managed to raffle off the Golf R and sell the uh, F-Type and then kept the i30 as a good little daily driver for now. That'll have to go soon though. And then followed that up again with the, X, the first X3M video. So that I think the first one did like 300,000 views and like 200 and over 250,000 I think then like nearly 250,000 so I had a really good three video run and that was kind of the turning point so like when I'd gone you know businesses sold and then just have that it was like the perfect opportunity to be able to you know push harder with the edits push harder with the builds like get more into a video all this sort of stuff which is exactly what I wanted and it seems to have so far paid off um you know it's still fairly newly into it I guess it's only not even six months but so did you pinch yourself when you're on those road trips tell me about that story that you were just it's just like the road trips are epic like it's there's always a story to come home with like and there's certain points on them where y- you hate yourself or you hate your car or like there's something about it you just you cannot stand but when you get back it's just like that was the best time <laughs> so i ended up taking that uh jaguar f type it had i think eighteen thousand miles on it bought it as a category s again crashed from copart or uh, this was from ebay but it had been bought from oh, wow. similar so it was just someone who bought it to then sell on. So they obviously made a bit of money off me, which is fine. I got to view the car first. So you kind of know what you're getting into. Um, yeah, got that car repaired. And then, so myself in that, Matt went in his Mercy uh, just after it had been painted. And Matt's dad went in the Aston. Uh, and then we ended up bumping into Nico on the way as well. But um, that was pure fluke. Then at the Nürburgring, I let Misha have a go in the F-Type. The supercharger belt like, within two corners just snapped straight off it. No idea how. I'd done like 3,000 miles in the car at this point. I was like, what's the chances? Um, and then that took out like the brakes with it and everything. So we had to leave that car at a garage at the Nürburgring. And it was like, do I stay with the car and hope they can fix it? Or do I take a higher car, which ended up being a Renault Clio, and carry on? So I took the higher car. This Clio was epic, by the way. Such a good car. <laughs> <laughs> Fastest car in the world. Um so it's basically like a ring hire car. Well, that's what Clarkson used to say when we were watching Top Gear when we were younger, right? You said the fastest car in the world's a hire car. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. This, well, this one was even faster because it was a Clio. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, ended up getting that down to Switzerland uh, after two days, and then I had a phone call off the guy who had the Jag and said, um, "You know, we might be able to get this fixed today, might." And I was like, 
if there's a chance, I want the Jag back. I don't really want to be driving the Clio when everyone else is driving these cars. So I took a 10-hour drive. I think it was, a, it was. I can't remember if it was exactly 10. might have been a bit less than that. Anyway, eight hours, something like that, from Switzerland to the Nürburgring. Picked the Jag up and drove straight back um, in one day, in one sitting, which was like it was probably one of like the hardest mentally things I've done. Um and then by the time we got back to the oh, hotel, I was there, say, I've done one. I've done a one way where I got up at eight o'clock in the morning, went to the Nurburgring, and that took about eight hours. Yeah. To then think about just immediately then driving back, you you did that straight away. Yeah, well, it's, it was funny because the the Clio actually started breaking on the way back, so I got about <laughs> two hours away, and it was like misfiring. And the only speed it had sit at was a hundred mile an hour. That was the only speed it was happy at. But luckily, obviously, Nur- uh, German autobahns, you can Send you up. can stay fast. Yeah. So. Um, it, I just managed to limp it back, get the jag, and just sailed it back again. And it, it was hard. It was tough. But it made it even... like That's not a great way to spend your holiday anyway. Um, and then the next day, woke up in the hotel, had breakfast, all that sort of stuff. And we bumped into Nico, the watch guy. You have, you have, you have we would like guys. Nico to come on. We're Nico. talking about a trip to Ireland at the minute to go I'll, and I'll, drink I'll, some Guinness I'll, and I'll have a podcast. Get, I will help him come on here. <laughs> um, he... Yeah, we bumped into him at the hotel, complete fluke, but obviously he was in his 812, we were in these, like, let's go for a drive, perfect. Got about 30 minutes down the road to a petrol station, him and Matt decided to start doing some donuts in the car park. I've seen the video. It wasn't a good time. <laughs> I didn't do anything at this point. I was Admittedly, I was lining up to, like I wanted to get involved, but at this point I hadn't. I'd already had a bad couple of days and then got like took back to the police station like held there until like got final yeah, so, so basically you started doing the donuts i'm sure people that are listening would have seen the video mm. but they started doing the donuts and the police came yeah it was like perfect timing um, was, was this in switzerland yeah yeah swiss police aren't very weren't very forgiving no no, no not at all and uh yeah i ended up getting fined like to be fair, Matt, hats off to me. He ended up paying my fine because he felt bad for me. Admittedly, I had just spent about two grand getting the car fixed, whatever it was. But <laughs> it was an expensive trip for me. But uh, yeah, it just it was just one of those trips where you just feel like nothing else could go wrong after all of this. And it just kept getting worse. And uh, obviously at the side of the road in Italy on the way to Monaco, Nico's car, brand new. You know, I think it had just over a thousand miles on it. Something. It literally has his name on the door plaque. Or yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. Like fully spec to him. It's like a gorgeous car. It just cut out. Like could not get it going for love nor money. It was, like, it was not healthy. One bit. We managed to like clear the codes, do a bit of fiddling, and get it limped to um, like a service station up the road, and then ended up waiting there for like five hours for him to get recovered. While Matt was sipping a pina colada. <laughs> oh, they are they gone? gone. Yeah, they just gone. gone to Monaco at this point. Yeah, or... yeah I don't blame them. To be yeah, fair. no fair. If I could have, I would have. Again, um, back to the Top Gear days. That's what they would have done, exactly. right? <laughs> Always leave a man behind. Um, but yeah, I thought Nico was in a bad place. Best of he was like, as you would be like, that's his biggest investment that he's probably ever made in a car, and for it to just be stuck at the side of the road in in Italy, it's just got to be so stressful. Especially when he doesn't really have like the same understanding of cars as what we do. He's not. He's, he loves cars, but he's not like mechanically minded with them. So I felt like I had to stick with him. But we got it kind of, the guy came out and then put a jump back on it and said, oh, it's all right. So we carried on driving it. I ended up driving it some of the way, which was, yeah, everyone like on the dash, but it was a lovely car. But as you, as you said, chaos aside a little bit of all of that happening, do you end up having to just pinch yourself and thinking, you know, a few years ago, I was doing my window tiles or I was cleaning me cars and I was kind of chilling and finding me way in love. And I'm now, granted it's broken down, but on, <laughs> or, or stood in a Swiss police station because we've just been told off for doing donuts in a car park in supercars. Like, how does your brain process all of that stuff going yeah, on? It was it was really odd because I remember saying to Nico while I was there, it's like, if you had told me this morning when I woke up that I'd have spent my day stood at the side of a motorway with you, like, bear in mind, someone I've never met before, and I'd have told you, like, you're lying. It's not true. Like, it's, even that morning, like, you could have said that to me. And I'd have still said that that wouldn't have happened. But I think that's one of the beautiful things with YouTube is you never know what's going to happen next. There's always, like, this unknown thing that something mad could happen. And you just, because of what you do, because you're pushing everything that you've got to, like, the extreme, like, with the cars, with this, and, like, the positions you put yourself in, things always end up happening, which is, like, it keeps you on your toes. It makes your life exciting. Do you dream about that, the next level, though? that stuff when you when you're putting all the work in you're thinking right now might be the time that i need a unit need the next stage i need to sort these cars do you have like a vision of where you want to go where the cut not the end point but the next big goal is i think the next big goal for me I, i've already uh, no one knows this on my channel i've already put my name down on a unit that i'm going to be moving into in march so that's like 
2,400 square foot units and much bigger than what I'm used to working in. Wow. Um, but I feel like I'm going to need it because you can so quickly, you expand to your space, don't you? So I need like room to, you can see how, it, uh, you guys can't at home, but you can see how ridiculous it is trying to work, how I'm working at the moment. It just doesn't make sense almost. And you actually mentioned, which baffled me a little bit, which a lot of people might not know about the crash damage world and youtube it's just like little things like getting rid of parts mm. there's so many parts outside around the yeah. van that we had to navigate reversing into and you was like yeah but i can't get rid of them yeah so just like explain the hat so yeah like the metal stuff is not a problem like people will come and take the metal because they want it for scrap it might be like cats old exhausts you know bits of aluminium steel whatever it is but then you're still stuck with all of these plastic parts that no one wants the skips won't uh, sorry the, the tips won't take them i've got nowhere to put a skip because my driveway is full um, I can't block access to the garage. I don't want to put it on in my garden, obviously. Um, so at the moment, I've just got parts Stuff. just spilling out my ears. That I've uh, no worth to anyone. Um, but I've only managed to get rid of them once before by saying, like, you can have all the metal stuff, you just got to take everything else because I just can't get rid of it. No, I, I hope you obviously dealt with that in the right way. But And what about the people around you that you grew up with that you were saying, obviously, um, you think a lot of your mum and dad and you've got your brother who was the one that kind of gave you that opportunity to make your first bit of money yeah, going yeah, into I a sales so. job. What do they think looking at, well, it's just like, oh, I do YouTube for a living. This is kind of what I do. I rebuild completely ma- manic cars. And I, I put them back together and film them and people love it. It's a strange one because like early on, like people, you know, people I know from school, things like that, they'll like, they'll laugh at you for, a bit for it, which I think is kind of normal in the UK. It's kind of normal to mock people for trying, which isn't really nice. I don't really vibe that too much. Um, you know, if um, it happens with everything though, it happens with everything at any point. Like there'll always be people that try and take the mickey out of you for something when you're trying to do something. It was the same when I started my detailing business. Like, oh, why are you going to do that for? Why are you? Why are you bothering? You can't charge that much to wash a car or this, that and the other. So yeah, you always get that early on. But then I think as you you, you make your footing in that territory and you kind of, you know, they start to take it a bit differently. But then you realise who's got your back and who hasn't so much, which I think is is quite a nice a nice thing to be able to see more clearly. So, so what do they think looking in? Do you ever sit down you know and say, or like at Christmas, like, well, what are you doing now at the minute, Chris? Do they watch all your videos? So my family, yeah, that, that what I just said wasn't to do with my family, but my family are just like, they're just super supportive of it. They're super supportive. I couldn't ask for any better, really. Um, they realise that, you know, no risk, no, no reward. Uh, that's exactly how this game works. And I think they've seen it now as a, you know, a good way for me to channel my passion for cars and, you know, run a business is one. And it's just kind of, they just love it, really. Well, I can't wait to see your channel go to the next stage. This snowball effect that's happening with what's going on on youtube and the influx of people interested in this stuff but then the the way in which you're able to deliver it in a way that captivates a hundred thousand people a week to tune into your content as fast as they possibly can you've definitely figured out the recipe and i look forward to tuning into the rest of your build on the x3m behind wish me luck i'm gonna need it <laughs> <laughs> grace thank you for coming on road to success it's been a pleasure My to pleasure. host you and uh, i'm sure we'll be seeing you again at the next milestone wicked